Okay, today's lecture is going to be on a very important concept. It's actually a synthesis of a lot of the material that we've learned up to date. And the broad question is, how do continents form? So, first thing that always happens is we get uh, volcanic island arcs. And we did talk about that before, but I'll do a, a quick review. How do we get island arcs form? Or how do we get them to form? And it's a fairly uh, complex process, but it always begins with two oceanic crusts that hit against each other. So it's a convergent zone involving two oceanic crusts. And one of them is going to be a little bit more dense than the other. And so it's going to subduct. And as it subducts, what we get, if it subducts deep enough, is we get some melting that occurs along that subduction line. And that melting simply happens. Well, it happens for a bunch of reasons, actually, but uh, so it's really not that simple at all. But I'll get into those in a couple of minutes. The rising magma, uh, because the magma is less dense than the surrounding rock, what happens is it rises and it, uh, it will, if it's able to find its way to the surface, uh, it'll be thrown out as uh, part of a volcano. If it can't, it'll end up as a pluton. Interesting little aside, by the way, a uh, pluton is named for Pluto, who was the Roman god of the underworld. So kind of a, a fitting name since plutons are intrusive and they always form uh, inside of the crust, not at the surface. Now, how do we, it brings up an interest, interesting question though, how do we see evidence of plutons on the surface of the earth? Well, that's through weathering processes. So eventually the, these things, these, uh, these intrusions, these plutonic intrusions, such as dikes and sills or batholiths, could be exposed at the surface of the earth, but uh, through processes of weathering. Okay, so back to our island arc. Uh, what happens is we can account for a single volcano by a rising column of magma, and that magma is able to, if it's able to percolate its way all the way up to the surface, uh, if it uh, is ejected at the surface, what it will do is solidify and form and build uh, a large volcano. And so in this case, what we can see is a composite, a large composite volcano. And that composite volcano um, uh, will form an island if it uh, grows high enough to actually poke above the surface of, of the ocean. The reason that we get these things forming in arcs is easier to explain if I use an orange. And so that may be on a separate video or I might just cut to that video uh, and uh, I'll do a little demo. Hello and welcome to my kitchen. Uh, actually, it's my wife's kitchen because I try to spend as little time in here as possible unless I'm eating. Speaking of food, I'm going to use this picture here to help demonstrate a concept that has to do with the formation of continents. So the first step in the formation is we have two plates that are moving towards each other. We have a pen and draw that on here. So we've got one plate moving this way, and we've got a plate moving this way. And let's just pretend for argument's sake that they're both oceanic plates. That's a pretty bad pen. I should be able to do better than that. There we go. So we get a nice big pen. There's one oceanic plate, and there's the other oceanic plate. Now one of them is going to be more dense than the other. And so the more dense plate... Hey, this is going to be kind of fun. There we go. <laughs> All right. Um, the more dense plate is going to subduct under the less dense plate. And that's going to look something like this. So let's pretend that this plate, which is one of his eyes, uh, is going to subduct under this plate. It's not going to subduct straight in. So when, when the plate starts to actually move into the mantle, the deep mantle, it's not going to descend uh, perpendicular to the surface of the earth. Instead, it's going to cut in at an angle. So let's have a look at that. What that would look like is this. It would slice, I've got to be careful not to hit my finger here. What it would do is actually cut in like this. And so if you look, or if you imagine this, we've got a plate moving along here, plate moving this way, this one subducts, it cuts in just like this knife blade. And if you take a look at what we've got left, it's an island arc. Now the only thing is, of course, if we do a cut like that, we got to get rid of this and we've got to make it look kind of sad because that would really hurt. Um, and the last step, of course, is to uh, eat the orange. This orange does look rather good. Let's just cut that. Mmm, vitamin C. And back to the lecture now. What happens once you've got an island arc? Well, the island arc can be a bunch of distinct volcanoes, separated volcanoes, or maybe a couple together on a little bit larger island. But how does this, this grow into a continent? Well, what happens is this rising magma uh, doesn't all get ejected, as we've already talked about, as part of a volcano. Most of it forms plutons. And these in volcanic intrusions, or plutons, uh, will build up eventually 
and create a fair bit of material underneath the volcanoes and around the volcanoes and kind of fill in all the blank spots. And so eventually what we're going to get is not just an island arc, but a large uh, subcontinent, or a better name for that is a terrain. And these terrains will actually uh, uh, interconnect all of the volcanic islands and form, well, kind of what we see in, uh, in Japan. If these things uh, then are, are, are pushed to the point where they actually, uh, the part of the plate is subducting and they hit the, the coast or the continental plate, what will happen is these things will actually glue themselves onto the continent and we'll see new continental material being formed. Now that's exactly what happened on the west coast of North America. And what geologists found through a variety of studies is that there's these distinctive zones or terrains, uh, each of which is geologically distinctive from the one that's around it. And all of these, um, or all of the material inside of, say, the Amonica belt would have formed around the same time period. And all of the material inside of the Intermontane belt, again, would have formed around the same time. It would have uh, started as an island arc. It would have then had uh, a large batholith, presumably, that formed underneath it. It would have been part of a subducting plate. It would have been pushed up against the North American plate. And it would have glued itself on because it was about the same density as the North American plate. Okay, there's just a, a little bit of a close-up. We actually stood along part of the Fraser Fault which is a, a connection between the coast belt and the intermontane belt. Uh, it's a, it's a dis, um, uh, <laughs> an extinct fault, thank you. And, uh, uh, but we were only on, uh, along one small part of it when we did that field trip to, uh, to Yale back in September. Okay, so a batholith. Exactly what is that and how big is it? Well, it's an igneous intrusion and it can be really, really big. So how big is this one, for example? Well, this is um, the Coast Plutonic Complex. It happens to be the largest granitic outcrop in North America. And it formed when the ancient Farallon Plate was subducting under the west coast of North America. There's a little bit left of that Farallon Plate, by the way. I don't know if you remember this. You don't have to know this, but it's the Juan de Fuca Plate. That's the last little bit. There's actually a few other smaller bits down in this area. Uh, but in BC, that's the, the last little bit that we can see. The tail end of that Farallon Plate all the rest of it has subducted and is deep underneath uh, North America. And I, f I think, in fact, it stretches pretty much all the way to, uh, to the east coast of North America. Okay, so that's a batholith for you. Uh, and now we get to our diagram. We're finally going to start filling this thing in. And I guess what we should do first is draw a water line. So that blue line there is a water line. If you want to draw that in, you can. Uh, and let's keep going here. So we've got an arrow showing that there is continental or sorry there is plate motion this way and that plate motion is coming from the divergent zone that we can see here so this is a, a rising plume of magma uh, it's a mid-ocean ridge and it's a divergent tectonic zone and so we can see one part of it the right part is moving to the right towards this continental plate and so the continental plate will show the motion there with another arrow an opposite arrow that's uh, that's going this way you might want to add that into your diagram We've also got an arrow going this way again. We've got a divergent zone, so we need to put that in there. And over here, what we have is not a continental plate, but this is supposed to be part of an island arc. So this is uh, basalt mostly, or mafic material, or oceanic, uh, basically oceanic material. And it's formed uh, an island arc, which is presumably going to be intermediate in composition, actually. Sorry, the, the basalt would be what's subducting here. We would get a rising column of magma. We're not going to focus on this today. Uh, and that rising column of magma would be less, or sorry, more felsic than the material that descends. So if we've got mafic material here, we'll probably have intermediate material here. And we're saying in this diagram, for argument's sake, that it's moving towards uh, the descending the descending oceanic plate here. Okay, and finally, uh, we'll start labeling this thing, actually, and, and we've got ultramafic material deep down in this rising magma plume. And we, I just drew a couple little arrows in here to show that once it gets up to the surface, it's moving away from that, uh, from that rising plume. We better put a pirate ship in there, so remember that's water. And maybe we'll just pause for a quick little joke here. Uh, by the way, I ran this joke by my wife, and she said it was terrible. Uh, so with her full support, I will tell a little pirate joke. Long ago lived a seaman named Captain Bravo. He was a manly man who showed no fear in facing his enemies. One day while he was out sailing the seven seas, a lookout spotted a pirate ship, and the crew became frantic. Captain Bravo bellowed, bring me me red shirt. The first mate quickly retrieved the captain's red shirt, 
and while he was wearing the red shirt, he led his men into battle and defeated the pirates. Later on that day, the lookout spotted not one but two pirate ships approaching. The captain again called for his red shirt, and once again, through the f though the fighting was fierce, he was victorious over both ships. That evening, all the men were sitting around on the deck, talking about the day's triumphs, and one of them asked him why he needs his red shirt before battle. And the captain said, well, if I'm wounded in the attack, the shirt will not show my blood, and thus you men will continue to fight unafraid. All the men sat in silence, and they marveled at the courage of such a manly man as Captain Bravo. As dawn came the next morning, the lookout spotted not one, not two, but ten pirate ships approaching from the far horizon. The crew stared at the captain and waited for his usual reply, and Captain Bravo calmly shouted, Get me me brown pants! Okay, my wife didn't get it either. Uh, all right, moving right along here. Uh, mafic material. I really shouldn't tell jokes, I know. Uh, mafic material is what we're going to see. This is basalt, uh, on the surface at least. And uh, uh, that mafic oceanic crust material is moving and eventually is going to subduct. We got felsic material over here. And how we got this felsic material is uh, basically what we're focusing on this lecture on. We've got a magma plume here. The magma plume, actually, the rising column or plume is down a little bit lower, but the top of it would be up here. We've got uh, a reduction in pressure, which helps to melt. Why do you get a reduction in pressure? Well, what's happening is deep down inside of the crust, or perhaps even inside of the mantle, we've got tremendous pressure around, around this, uh, this magma plume. But because this stuff is able to exit, uh, we actually do have a reduction in pressure because this stuff is, is flowing out over the surface. It's forming pillow basalts, or as a result of the crustal movement, the oceanic crustal movement, the, the divergent zone, and the formation of new crust, what we get is a slight decrease in pressure. And that actually helps all of this stuff to stay melted and not behave like, like plastic or, or solid, which it would if it were under uh, even more pressure. All right, so now we get into what actually causes continents to form. And one of the steps, one of the first steps is partial melt. I think the term that we use is partial melting. And that partial melting has a lot to do with Bowen's reaction series. And if you take a look at that chart down at the bottom, you see quartz. And quartz has the lowest melting temperature. So as the temperature increases along this subducting line, the very first minerals that melt uh, are going to be quartz. Following that, you can simply move up Bowen's reaction series and you can trace which elements, uh, or sorry, which, which minerals are going to melt next. And so what we find are that the most felsic materials melt first. If enough of those felsic materials melt and form together, they're going to be quite buoyant. They're going to be a lot less dense than the surrounding material. And so they're going to start to rise and force their way up. And so that's why we get these rising columns of magma uh, more felsic magma than what it what the original rock was, uh, and that has to do with partial melting. So partial melting really is a simple term. It simply means that different minerals melt at different temperatures. And you again, you can see that along Bowen's reaction series in the left-hand column, uh, where you've got temperatures that range from 600 degrees down at the bottom uh, all the way to 1,200 degrees with olivine up at the top. So the olivine, the dark the ferromagnesium minerals, the most dense minerals, are going to probably stay in more or less a solid state and continue to descend with this um, subducting plate. Some of those materials may melt. In fact, in the hottest places, all of the material might melt. But that's where the next, uh, the next process comes in, and that's fractional crystallization. And so what happens here is if we've got a, a small area, let's say if we could just take a small little piece of this melting magma and analyze it, what we would find is that the densest materials tend to stay low in that magma pool and the least dense materials tend to rise up. Oh, just a sec, the phone's ringing. I think we know who this is going to be. Excuse me for a second. Hello? Oh. Josie does have school. Yeah, yeah, they didn't close the school down. Now, now Mom, can I call you back in just maybe uh, maybe five minutes or so? I'm just... Okay. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll call you back in five minutes. I'm, I'm just, just doing a recording. Okay. 
I'm back. Uh, so I think I was talking about fractional crystallization, and I, I don't know. Hopefully we covered that one. Let's go on to assimilation of country rock. And assimilation of country rock, this is uh, an interesting one, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. But basically what happens in this process is this rising magma hits the country rock, and what it does when it contacts it is because the magma is incredibly hot, and because the composition of the country rock is mostly felsic, and so it has uh, uh, a fairly low melting temperature, is it actually melts some of it and absorbs it into the mix. And so the most felsic material, which of course is going to melt first, becomes part of this rising magma. Okay, uh, step four. Actually, this isn't step four at all. This probably should be step one. Uh, this is probably the most important step in the formation of continents because what happens is this descending plate, uh, when it gets to a certain level, what it actually does is all of the water, and there is a huge amount of water inside of subducting uh, oceanic crust, all that water gets forced out in a process that's called dewatering. Um, I heard a statistic and I have no way of verifying this, of course, but I heard a statistic that there's more water beneath the surface of the earth than there is above it. So in other words, if we take all of the oceans, uh, there's probably double that at least underneath the surface. So a, a remarkable amount of water. If it all came to the surface, uh, in fact, if all the water were put on the surface of the earth, what would happen is I don't think even Mount Everest would be, uh, would be viewable. Maybe if you stood right on the very peak, you might be able to poke your head up above the, uh, the water. Anyway, so this dewatering process, and don't worry, that's not going to happen. That's just, uh, it's, it's going to stay pretty much where it is, or the water, as part of the water cycle, water that gets, uh, that re-enters the crust, uh, it re-enters at about the same rate as water being released in this dewatering process. So anyway, these, the dewatering actually releases something called volatiles, which we've talked about, and those volatiles are hugely significant in beginning that melting process. So as soon as you take very hot rock and you add in gases or you add in basically water, uh, what happens is, is you change the whole dynamic. You add in new elements for which it can uh, uh, combine chemically. You also change the melting temperatures of the surrounding rocks. And so this is wh really where the action begins with, is with the dewatering process. So dewatering is simply the forcing out of all the water from the, uh, the pressure, the increased pressure of the descending uh, crust. Okay, and the last one is weathering. And this weathering process leaves felsic materials. And so what happens is all of the felsic materials eventually get washed back towards the ocean, back towards our waterline where that pirate ship is. And they form this little blue wedge uh, at the very front of the crust. And it's kind of like a plow. As this continental crust is moving towards the oceanic plate, uh, it, it has this large area at the front, this large blue area, called an accretionary wedge. And so basically, much like a plow, uh, uh, all those materials, weathered materials, and materials that have been ground up from the collision of the two plates, they tend to collect right at the very front, and that's what happens.